So what do we know about what causes corruption? One of the best pieces on this topic is by Daniel Treisman. Let's look at its results a little more closely. He rates countries on the basis of how corrupt they are using three different indices of corruption from a group called Transparency International. Most researchers regard these indices as actually pretty accurate. He then looks to see which features of a country are positively correlated with the country having a high rating for corruption. We'll look at the different hypotheses in this paper, noting, of course, that hypothesis doesn't mean it's true. It's simply something we're going to investigate. For instance, how much does having a common law system matter? Actually, it turns out this result is unclear. If a country is a colony of British origin, it turns out that having a common law system is correlated with lower corruption. But if the country was not previously a British colony, having a common law system is correlated with higher corruption. So on that, the effect of having a common law system is quite unclear. One of the most significant variables for explaining low levels of corruption is having had the heritage of being a British colony. This holds up even if we adjust for greater openness to trade or democracy or religious tradition. It seems that the former British colonies somehow had instilled in them greater protections against official abuse. There are two striking things about this correlation. First, in the former British colony, people are especially likely to have confidence in the quality of judges, more than they have confidence in the quality of politicians. Second is that, from a poll of businessmen, they're more likely to have confidence that the legal system will be enforced fairly. So if we try to think about which features of having been a British colony are the ones that are important, maybe it's not about electoral politics, but it's somehow the quality of the judiciary and its fairness. Countries with a Protestant religious tradition also are less corrupt on average. Why might this be? We really don't know. One interpretation is that Protestantism may allow for a greater tolerance for challenges to authority. A second possibility is the stress of Protestantism on casting out the wicked. Uh, some say that Protestantism allows for greater focus on the individual rather than the family, and this leads to less corruption. Finally, it's been suggested that Protestant societies tend to have greater separation of church and state, and that may be another factor. But the data don't themselves allow us to judge on these issues. Democratic countries also tend to be less corrupt, but there's something very interesting in the data here. Simply having democracy now doesn't make the country less corrupt. The democracies which are less corrupt are those which have had uninterrupted democracy for 40 years or more. So actually, it's the distant past which matters. It's the traditions which are fostered by having long periods of democratic rule. You cannot create all the benefits of a democracy overnight. The wealthier and more literate countries are also less corrupt, and this is indeed a very strong effect. For instance, Reisman in the paper notes that a tenfold increase in the 1990 per capita GDP to go from, say, that of El Salvador to that of Canada would lead to a drop in the corruption rating of between 4.16 and 4.76 points. That would bring El Salvador up to somewhere about to the level of Hong Kong or Ireland in terms of having a low level of corruption. Wealth here really matters. Is it the case that corruption is low and public salaries are relatively high, as has proved to be the case in Singapore? Well, in this data set, it turns out we simply can't tell. We'll be returning to this question later in another unit. What about political instability? Well, that actually doesn't turn up as being significant in any of these statistical regressions. So on that, in this paper, Treisman remains agnostic. What about government intervention in the economy? Does that cause more corruption? Well, on this again, the author isn't sure. He found that in his 1996 data, there was a connection between government intervention and corruption, but when he looked at the 1997 and 1998 data sets, it turned out there wasn't a connection. So on this, as with political instability, he remains agnostic. What about openness to trade? Well, when exposure to imports is high, corruption is somewhat lower, but this is actually quite a small effect, quantitatively. How about lots of natural resources? Do they tend to make a country more corrupt? This is again a case where it's hard to say. When we look at data from the 1980s, it appears there is a relationship. But when we look at data from the 1990s, it appears that relationship has gone away. This is yet another case where some agnosticism is in order. How about ethnic division, or what is sometimes called ethno-linguistic fragmentation? Well, it turns out that this doesn't seem to predict corruption. 
Once we adjust for the wealth of an economy, it turns out that ethnic division doesn't matter for explaining corruption. Corruption is correlated with having a federal structure, much as the United States does. Why might this be? Uh, we're not sure, but it could be that in a very decentralized society, there are all different levels of officials who can get in your way or stop something, and maybe that makes it more likely that you'll need to bribe one of them. So overall, what are the most robust variables for predicting corruption? They turn out to be British heritage, Protestant tradition, economic growth, having a federal structure, uninterrupted democracy for 40 years or more, and openness to imports. These variables together actually can account for more than 89% of the variation in the Transparency International Indices of Corruption. That's actually a somewhat impressive result. You might also wonder which are the countries which are more corrupt or less corrupt than the model predicts. Well, if we look to the 1980s, the countries which turn out to be more corrupt than their underlying variables would predict, those are Thailand, Mexico, Egypt, Indonesia, Haiti, and Zaire. Uh, in the 1990s, the list changes. It's Italy, Belgium, and, sorry to say, my country, the United States. Interestingly, over this period of time, Africa on the whole is less corrupt than the model predicts. Given its relatively low level of per capita income, we would expect Africa to be more corrupt than it really is. What can we say about what's cause and what is effect? For instance, if wealthier nations are less corrupt, is it the case that because they are wealthy, they are less corrupt? Or is it the case that because they are less corrupt, they are wealthy? Arguably, both effects are operating. This is a tricky problem in many statistical investigations. Treisman attempts to overcome it by focusing a lot of his attention on very long-term variables which are not changing in the short run with corruption. For instance, if you think about our list of the variables which really mattered, 40 years or more of democracy, a British colonial heritage, and Protestant religious tradition, there's really not a plausible way to say that low corruption brought about the Protestant religious tradition from the distant past. It's far more likely to be the case that the Protestant religious tradition is the active variable in some manner driving the lower level of corruption. This paper leaves a lot of open questions and questions unanswered or hanging or maybe areas where we're agnostic, but still it's considered to be one of the most important studies of the causes of corruption.